Coming up on Tech News Today, Intel gets into the TV business. Opera feeds the monoculture and House of Cards is a hit. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, February 13th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash TNT. And by Podio from Citrix. Manage your projects with files, instant communication, and collaboration all in one workspace. Start using Podio today. It's free. Just visit Podio.com to sign up, set up your first workspace, and invite your team to get started. Work the way you want with Podio.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 in the news feed. Apple's prices are usually considered expensive, so when they drop the prices, people get very excited. And that's what's happening today. The 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina drops $200 to 1499 The 256-gigabyte version sheds $300 to 1699 Also, the 256-gigabyte MacBook Air drops $100 to $1,399. The 13- and the 15-inch MacBook Pros with Retina display also get slight processor speed upgrades. Opera has hit the three. 300 million monthly user milestone. Congratulations, Opera, and wants to change things up a bit. Presto, the current rendering engine, is going away in favor of WebKit, and the company will devote its resources toward innovation and polish on its browser products. That's their words. Opera will be showing off ICE, its WebKit-based experiment for iOS and Android devices, at Mobile World Congress later this month. If you polish ice, doesn't that just melt? Anyway, Bloomberg reports that Apple has a team of about 100 people working on a smartwatch, citing two people familiar with the company's plans. The team is made up of engineers, marketing folks, and managers. Bloomberg sources say that that size of team suggests Apple is beyond the experimentation phase. They're out of college. Uh, those of you tired of all the mobile phone attention these days should cheer at this. Mobile phone sales dropped in 2012, 1.7%, according to Gartner. Feature phones caused the decline, dropping 19.3% year over year in the last quarter of 2012. Smartphone sales jumped 38.3% in the same period, dominated by Apple and Samsung, which accounted for 52% of the smartphone market combined. And for fanboys keeping score, Android clocks in at 69.7% of all smartphones sold in the quarter, while iOS accounted for for 20.9%. Now, spin those numbers, fan people. The circle is complete. Gadget website Gadget, founded by Engadget's founder Peter Rojas and founding editor Ryan Block, has been purchased by AOL, parent company of Engadget. Got that straight? In a blog post on Gadget, Block explained that the site will bring its community and its technologies and its product database to AOL's web properties and will also team up with the Engadget team on live events throughout the year. At the Dive Into Media Conference, VP and General Manager of Intel Media, Eric Huggers, confirmed that Intel is working on a way to bring television to the Internet. The set-top box that Intel is working on is already being tested by hundreds of Intel employees. Huggers didn't mention if the user would be able to get channels a la carte and said Intel plans on offering a superior experience and its service is not a value play. So it's going to be really expensive. But you like it. But you'll love it, yeah. As expected, U.S. President Barack Obama signed an executive order yesterday regarding so-called cybersecurity. The order charges the National Institute of Standards and Technology with the task of creating voluntary best practices, while the Orwellian Department of Homeland Security works on encouraging agencies to adopt the guidelines. The order provides for privacy protection but cannot protect companies from liability. Congress would need to pass legislation for that to happen. Brazilian regulators have ruled that Apple does not have exclusive rights to use the term iPhone trademark in the country. The decision is the result of a local company called Gradiente Electronica registering the name in 2000. My Brazilian 
accent is not very good. Seven years before Apple did. However, the Institute of Industrial Property told the BBC it understood Apple was pursuing an appeal. Apple will still have exclusive rights to use the iPhone name elsewhere on clothing and software and across publications. See, you did better than me. I, I couldn't have resisted a wax joke in there somewhere. I don't even understand what that means. Neither do I. Okay. Researchers at Universidad Carlos Tres de Madrid That was bad. Have developed a new <laughs> system. <laughs> okay, I just want to make you feel better. New system capable of increasing GPS accuracy as much as 90%. The system could be installed in a car or a smartphone. It combines GPS with other sensors like accelerometers and gyroscopes, decreasing the margin of error from around 15 meters to around 2 meters. This can make a big difference for self-driving vehicles that nope. need that pinpoint. No nope car wax jokes? Netflix chief content officer Ted Sarandos says that Netflix's original program, House of Cards, is the most watched piece of content on Netflix worldwide right now. He didn't give any hard numbers on how many viewers the show garnered or how many hours of video were consumed, but said that nearly all viewers of episode one watched episode two. Oh, Brazilian wax. Now Got it. Thing, light goes on. Tight. And we're all home. Tight. Tightly run ship today. Hey, if you're looking for B-roll of Brazil, check out Pond5, P-O-N-D-5.com. That is the place to go if you're a media maker. I know a lot of you guys either want to get into podcasting, want to do blogging, want to do your own media. And one of the things you got to be careful of is if your stuff gets really popular and you're using someone else's images, you can get in trouble. So Pond5 provides a safe harbor. You pay a little money, but you don't pay a lot of money. And then you can legally use this stuff in your creations. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And they've got great B-roll in there. Uh, they've got, you know, look at this crowd thing that we're showing. The, the nice shots of time lapse of cars going by. All kinds of stuff like that. But they also have vector illustrations, music tracks, sound effects, customizable motion graphics, templates, 3D models, all that stuff you need to make a great looking video project, audio project, photo project, whatever you're working on. And one of the reasons they have such a wide ranging, high quality library to choose from is because of these people cheering. No, it's uh, because of the, the fact, the reason they're cheering is because you can upload your own stuff. You get to set your own price and they pay 50% royalties on each and every sale. So if you're a media maker, you're an artist, you should absolutely check out Pond5. Take your creativity to the next level or upload your own content. Put it to work at the world's most artist-friendly marketplace for stock media. And to get you interested to see what they have to offer, this month you can get 50 free stock media files at pond5.com slash TNT. That's pond5.com slash TNT. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, let's start off discussing some of these stories today with that Intel. You're not going to like the price, but you're going to like the service. You're going to like the way it fits. Yeah. Hey, at the Dive Into Media Conference, I like, guarantee. like I mentioned, Eric Huggers, who's, the, who's Intel's GM of media, he said that the reports are true. Intel is working on TV over the Internet. Now, he says they're going to have live TV, catch-up television, on-demand, and a set of applications like I said before, not a value play, but a superior uh, experience comparing the old standard TV grid that we get for information to the, his first Commodore 64, saying there's a lot of room for improvement. Also, speaking to CNET, Hugger said that the service won't be Intel branded, but it will come to smartphones at some point as well. So it might be through some other carriers. As for content, uh, Intel, uh, Hugger said that Intel is working with the entire industry to figure out how to get proper television. So what about a la carte channels? He said they want to give consumers choice, control, and convenience, but he thinks there's a value in bundles, which is going to crush everybody's hopes. But he's, he's saying that the industry isn't ready for a la carte, but you might be able to get smaller bundles through Intel. You might, might be in these giant packages. The hardware, a little creepy, comes with a camera, which could watch you. Now, Huggers gave an example where the camera could help in synchronizing viewer, uh, viewing if you're watching around the country or something. Obviously, some people are thinking advertising, and the camera could be turned off. So before everyone freaks out, that's that's an option. Tom, after finding out all these details, these are this is from Intel. Does anything sound exciting to you? So when you say details, you mean vague statements? Well, before it was Intel <laughs> rumor to TV. He wants to consumers choice, control, and convenience. Right. What's vague about that? I I take it back. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, the one big detail is Intel confirms, yeah, yeah, we're definitely working on this project. But really, he, he threw out a lot of platitudes. Like, you want a la carte? Of course we all want a la carte. Maybe we'll... You're not going to get a la carte. Maybe you'll get something like a la carte. Smaller bundles? Some people are doing smaller bundles. So I, I, I'm very interested to see what they come up with. I'm more encouraged by the fact that you've got people from Apple Apple, people from Google, uh, apparently working on this team. Uh, and this is a brand new team. I think the worry when these rumors first came out was, 
what does Intel know about this business and what are they you know what are they going to spit out I remember when Intel came out with cameras and sound effects toys and stuff uh, is it going to be another thing like that so it sounds like they're doing the right thing and saying we're basically creating an entirely separate organization that can take advantage of what we know from making hardware and making chips and and create something cool so I'm I'm going to try to remain positive about what might actually come out of this. Uh, there are, I mean, Apple's working with the whole industry. Everybody's working with the whole industry. It just doesn't doesn't mean that Intel's got a lock on this, but it's a good effort, it seems C like. Can we talk about the camera for a second? What What is this synchronizing viewing across the country? So in theory, nonsense? let's say we all wanted to watch, I don't know, how, how, how cards, cards is a bad example. Let me say the Sopranos or something was okay. on new, and okay. you wanted to watch at the same time as I was on, on demand. Yeah. Let's let's find out what point we are when we're watching this. So they can watch when you're watching. As opposed to going, okay, be on Skype or on the phone and go, three, two, one, start playing now. You'd be able to synchronize your viewing parties, so I to just speak. don't see why the camera needs to show a person in order to have that information. I guess they could see you what, if you're watching it or not. I think that's about it. They could read your expression. <laughs> I don't know. No. If you're happy with the no, ad. I, I, do you find that to be extra, extra creepy? Yeah, I do. I, if, if, why is there a camera on a device at all unless it's somehow recording my motion? You know, if I'm fast forwarding or I'm I, I, that sort of thing in a connect like way, that's one thing. Otherwise, no, I don't want to be well, looked at. And I think that's the key, right, is you, we, we think like, OK, what are they going to use this camera for? But you've got a camera on your laptop right now. We've got cameras on uh, from the Xbox, you know, with connect. There's cameras in a lot of smart TVs now. So you can do things like Skype. Well, I, who knows what they're going to use it for? Right, right, right. Well, if they're saying that the, if Huggers was saying that the TV grid system is kind of, a, or the guide system is a mess, and you have this camera, if you put them together, I'm thinking user profiles, mm -hmm. more specified things. Like if I'm sitting down, oh, like I want to see recognition. HD and sports things and movies. That's oh, the thing I, I want to see. As here's your as opposed yeah, to saying, okay. okay, somebody else is watching, my son is watching. Let's put up all the kids programming. Mm -hmm. Like that way, you have a different way of getting this information because oh look, Tom's watching boring documentaries. The, the documentary, documentary. Well, those are good stuff. But the thing is, I would think if you're going to bring a camera into the house, that would be the way to do it because. Right now, going through like direct TV and going through like 800 channels, mm -hmm. that takes as probably as long as a half hour show. So there's no point to that. I, I'm, I think there are more details in this than, than you're saying, Tom. The fact that they are saying they're working on something, that they are going to bring television over the internet. I don't really know how that works when it comes to bandwidth caps. I don't know how that's... Well, like, it works. I mean, Roku's doing it. Apple TV's doing it. But Xbox talking, is doing it. This I is mean, more like a cable s style, which is a lot more Aereo's channels. doing it. Well, Aereo is not paying for the back end or anything. Like There's also Sky is doing it in the UK already with their with their uh, I can't remember what it's called suddenly, but Sky Now I think. That sounds like it'll be a success. Yeah. Everybody else is doing it. I, I'd be interested to see what some of these bundles would look like. I mean, a la carte is, is sort of that that would be in a perfect world the way that I make my own bundles. But if you save a little bit of money, maybe having some, you know, if I could have like a. HBO, Showtime, Stars, something, you know, sort of like the premium movie channel package that would be a little bit less expensive than if I just went one, two, three, four, all, all the cart, that that could be valuable. Java 678 pointed out, the real key here is content. What partnerships do they strike yeah. with the people in the industry? Working with the people in the industry is the right way to go, but how successful they'll be in that, that makes or breaks this to yeah, me. Yeah, if they can get live sports, I think that's usually the big Yeah, one. yeah. You hang your hat on That'd that. huge. All right, Opera uh, made a big deal of announcing they have reached 300 million monthly users, and uh, that's that's huge. That's a big number. Congratulations to Opera. They also announced they're no longer going to use the Presto engine in their Opera browser. That means uh, they are going to go to WebKit. WebKit is the engine that powers Chrome. It powers Safari. It's the Chromium project, and Opera will actually be contributing to both those projects, WebKit and Chromium. They say they want a flexible and standards compliant while at the same time handling real world websites and they just can't do that with presto anymore it's just proved impossible uh the web is not as open as opera would like is what it sounds like developers optimize for webkit and they have found it difficult to remain standards compliant and usable on the real web. Uh, in a uh, blog posting from Opera's QA tester, Havard, who is not speaking on behalf of the company when he writes, but it is a company blog, he says, monoculture is bad because the big fear is if everybody's on WebKit, all of a sudden we only have one thing out there and we don't have a nice interplay of different features coming from different standards. It says, yes, monoculture is bad, but Opera was never really in a position to prevent it in the first place. Even with Opera as the dominant mobile browser and more than 300 million users in total across all platforms, web developers still designed just for WebKit. So that brings us down to three major engines here. We've got WebKit, 
We've got Microsoft's Trident, which is only used in Internet Explorer. And we've got the Gecko Engine from Mozilla. Uh, John Resig, who's a JavaScript guru, said, Don't worry that everyone moving to WebKit causes stagnation. Apple created WebKit. Google made it awesome. Opera will make it better. Is this a defeat for standards? Or is the fact that WebKit's an open platform anyway just mean that WebKit has now become where standards will get worked out between lots of big companies like Opera, Apple, and Google? Yeah, I mean, Opera's not, like, rolling over and saying, we give up, we're out of the running. They're saying, this is actually going to make what we do better. So I tend to agree with Resig uh, that says there, there's no reason to think that this is going to be a bad a move for Opera, and maybe WebKit will... Uh, experience some growth because of it. I mean, it's not like WebKit's a bad engine in the first place. I mean, it's been used by lots of different companies. I believe WebOS was based on it. So there's a whole lot of things that, that WebKit can do that other uh, engines couldn't do. But the thing about Opera is that when you want to use popular services like Google Docs and it's built for WebKit effectively, you can't use it on Opera properly. It just turns into a little bit of a mess. It almost works with the way things are. If Opera actually wants to grow its user base, which has been a very small minority, but it's been a very vocal one, I'm sure they'll get very upset, but if Opera wants to get more users, they have to be able to display websites in a way that works right now. Because right now, WebKit is kind of a de facto standard, but not, I mean, it's de facto. What's wrong with taking that and making it the official one? I'm not really sure about that. Well, the, what's wrong with it, what people get upset about is... Right now, we have four engines, and if one engine gets a feature, then that, that pushes the other uh, engines to add that feature, and, and, be, and, and it pushes the standards forward, and, and it's a good interplay. If you only have three, you have fewer ideas, fewer innovations, theoretically, uh, and as Bear, our sysadmin, pointed out in the chat room, uh, WebKit is a very fragmented standard. They are large forks that will never be reconciled, so it's not even the perfect standard. It's not even a standard in and of itself in there. I, I think that that points out the, the issue here, which is even though we have standards for the web, every browser ends up being different. And as a developer, you're always going to have to tweak it for the different browsers. That's one of the problems with writing HTML5 apps. You write an HTML5 app that works in Safari, it won't necessarily work in every other browser, even if those browsers are theoretically standards compliant. I mean, it seems like this move is really to just deal with the current reality. The thing is, if you're trying to compete, you have to have this. The thing is mobile, right? So Apple's all of Apple's browsers on iOS have to be WebKit based anyway. So you have that. Android used WebKit as well. So if they're going to be a major player in the mobile market, which is growing and growing and growing, this shift is kind of ne necessary. But I mean, I don't, I don't really see it as necessarily bad because the standards have taken, they take so long to get set up. I know that I used to do some coding stuff and I would always have my IE6 code and my everything else code. And that would drive me crazy. But if stuff was, if they worked better together, if this was standardized quicker, which it never is really a quick. So you're, are, it sounds like you're arguing that everyone should use should go to WebKit. No, and we should have a monoculture. I wish we had. I wish we had some kind of standard that actually was a standard that people use, but that hasn't happened well, that's human from the very beginning. Yeah, of there HTML. is a standard. It's the people using it. That's, that's it's yeah, it's issue. a little messy. Yeah, uh, and and uh, if you want to see Opera's uh, new WebKit-based browser in action, check out Mobile World Congress. They say they will unveil their Android-based Opera browser using the WebKit engine. Then, uh, so we'll 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 start to see the new world of opera at that point. It's gonna be okay. Is it? I don't know. Uh, I, I, just being optimistic. <laughs> I'm just saying it. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about something that's gonna be better. Slacker. Yeah, Slacker. Uh, Slacker. If you don't know what it is, Slacker Radio is. I guess you could call it a Pandora and a Spotify competitor. And in fact, they're spending quite a bit of advertising trying to make sure that you know that they're better than Pandora or Spotify. A 5.5 million advertising campaign that is a commercial that's going to run on, on the web, on, on, on YouTube, um, SB Nation, BuzzNet, or a few places uh, that they've, they've, they've bought a spot in. And in the commercial... A person complains that Pandora has a really small music library. It's just like, oh, there's not enough tracks in here. And Spotify sucks because it's always spamming my Facebook wall and blah, blah, blah. And, 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 and Slacker is where it's at. Uh, what's interesting about, you know, this, that's just sort of an advertising campaign, whether or not you think Pandora doesn't have a big library or that Spotify is really spammy is kind of up to you as the user. But uh, Slacker is, is, is actually ramping up. The company is about six years old. Um, it has doubled its staff. They have about 90 full-time employees in the past eight months alone, got an influx of money, and says that this is a music service that has 10 times the amount of songs that Pandora does. So 
that's quite a bit. Also says content from ESPN, from ABC Network, so they have different uh, relationships. Pandora gets about 90% of the sales, its sales, from ads. Slacker says, we focus on paid subscriptions, and that accounts for two-thirds of our revenue. They have a couple different subscriptions. You have a monthly $4 ad-free service that includes unlimited song skipping, so that's kind of, it's sort of like the Pandora model if you were paying for for uh, the, the ad-free version of Pandora. And then a $10 package that makes any song or album offered by Slacker available on demand. So that's more like a, a Spotify or an RDO or, you know, that, that sort of model. And the company says over 500,000 of their 4 million active users are paying subscribers, which you know, if, you, if you do the math, that works out better uh, than something like Pandora because Pandora gives more than half of uh, its revenues because they've got that royalty thing. Uh, that uh, were, were they, they, they basically take a loss um, every time they make a lot of money. Slacker says, we keep about 50% of the revenue that we generate, and that number should go up. We just have to attract more users. That's why we have to attack the companies that have a lot more users than us. Uh, and, and they do. I said Slacker had f about 4 million users. Spotify has more than 20 million. Pandora has more than 60 million un unique members monthly. So I read all of this, and I go, okay, Slacker, I mean... I think that they're, it's sort of, it's like kind of a Hail Mary play at this point, right? You, if, you're, if you're wanting to get into the streaming music business, well, they're in the streaming music business already, but they actually want to be a major player. That's what they've raised money to do. Basically attack companies that are more successful and see if somehow they can get people to come on over. I has, have you ever thought that Pandora doesn't have a big music library? Uh, no, I haven't found that to be the issue with Pandora, but I, I've used... I've used Slacker in the past, and I've been following Slacker since they were they actually had a piece of hardware that had all That's their right. stations preloaded, which I thought was a really interesting differentiator. But didn't really go anywhere. Because everything became apps. That's yeah. what happened. They were a little, like, I don't know if they were ahead of their time or just slightly behind on the times, but they had this device, which is really an interesting idea. The Slacker interface used to be really like this Windows Media Player style, black and dark blue, and very dark. It just felt somewhat unfriendly. Mm -hmm. Looking at the new design, it looks really like, okay, it's really graphical. It seems it's pleasant on the eyes. The stuff works really well. The player looks really good. I don't know if... Slow jams. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is going to get a bunch of people. Although there are ads about talking about linking the Spotify to Facebook. That's a pretty good example of how Spotify are very popular. Excellent uh, a catalog. I think 19 million uh, songs. But right now, no web component. Still only a desktop client. And you do have this potential of publishing everything you do to Facebook. I don't know if that's going to be enough of a backlash to get people to Slacker, but Slacker's got a ton of, of songs and also ESPN, which is very unusual. Well, and there's still the rumors. There's still rumors at this point that Apple is going to launch its own Pandora competitor. I feel like this is, it's one of these windows, right? We keep talking about uh, music streaming services, or I do anyway, because I really like music. But there, it's sort of this window where all of the companies are like, let's just go all in right now because if we can at least get uh, our user base to grow before Apple comes in and decimates everybody, then this is our time. I just... I just don't know. I, I don't know if uh, if Slacker is compelling enough for me to leave services that already work really well. I think that's the thing. They have an awareness problem. I forgot Slacker existed. Totally. I used to have it on my iPhone. I, while you were talking, I had to check and be like, do I still have it? I think that says something right there. I don't. I uh -huh. deleted it at right. some point, right? Uh -huh. So, the, yeah, they have to spend $5.5 million for awareness. I get that. But I still don't see what the message is. I'm not hearing anything that makes me go, ooh, well, I should definitely check out Slacker again. Right. Uh, because like you say, I mean, I don't look, play Pandora and think I'm missing a bunch of songs. I don't, you know, I, I, any more than I do on RDO or any other service. I, mean, I guess it really depends on what kind of hook their free service has, right? Because the thing is, I don't even think about choosing because right now everything I'm using is free. So I'll go to Spotify for something, Pandora for others, Slacker for others. doesn't really make a difference to me because I'm not paying yet. None of them have done a great job going, you know what, this is, service is so amazing, I'm going to plunk down money for it yet. So far, I haven't seen a big hook because even, even though you have a giant catalog, there's always something missing because I like, like Beatles music, and that's notoriously hard to get a license to. So okay. this is the kind of thing where I guess whoever gets that, that would be Apple. They could probably go, look, we got this and the Beatles. You can stay here forever. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Citrix and Podio. All the information you need for your work day. Think about where is it? Oh, yeah, I got some in email. I got some in that spreadsheet. I got some in that hard drive. Wait, someone's on that other hard drive over there. It's disorganized. It's impossible to manage that kind of way. Priorities are always shifting, so 
we've got the solution. Podio by Citrix. Podio allows you to manage all projects back and forth, instant communication, workflow from one easy-to-use platform, allowing you to work the way you want to with Podio, which if you're on audio is P-O-D-I-O. You have total flexibility to customize your collaborative workspaces to manage your projects, bring your team together. It doesn't matter if it's coworkers or if it's clients or external contacts, wh whoever you want in the project, you put them in there and your team can work from any mobile device. They've got a great iPhone app. They've got an excellent iPad app. They have all kinds of ways to manage your projects. We're trying it out uh, here at Twit and already uh, I can I can see that there's a lot of things we can do a lot better in this kind of interface. So start using Podio today. It's free. Join us. Visit Podio.com. That's P-O-D-I-O dot com. Sign up. Set up your first workspace and invite your team to get started. Work the way you want with Podio.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Yahoo CEO Marissa, did I just like guttural stuff? Yahoo. 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 Uh, Yahoo That's CEO a rebranding. <laughs> Marissa Meyer uh, was speaking at the Goldman Sachs Investment Conference. That's the same one Tim Cook was speaking at recently uh, and uh, laid down a little burn on the old Microsoft partnership. She said, quote, one of the points of the alliance is that we collectively want to grow share rather than just trading share with each other. Uh, she said, Microsoft deal is underperforming for them. Now, she didn't blame Microsoft. She just said the deal isn't really working. She also talked about planning to prune their sprawling lineup of mobile apps over there. She reiterated her focus on getting consumers to spend more time on Yahoo's online property. She says, I know what the problem is. The problem is impressions. We need more people seeing those ads. Uh, and she pointed out that Google market share hasn't shifted in the past two years since they signed the deal, since Yahoo signed the deal with Microsoft. Google market share was 66.7% this last December, according to Comscore. Two years ago, when the deal was signed between Yahoo and Microsoft, Google market share was 66.6%. .6 so it's increased in a statistically insignificant amount, but pretty much flat. Uh, what has changed is Yahoo's share of the search. In 2010, Yahoo had 16%, Microsoft had 12 This past December, Microsoft had 16.3%, Yahoo at 12.2%. So, okay, we can debate all day like, oh, okay, Yahoo's, you know, it's about time for Marissa Meyer to make some changes and how's that going to affect search and is she just going to uh, spruce up this relationship with Microsoft, try to, try to drive more people to their search engine and that's the solution? Or is she starting to sow the seeds of dissolving this partnership? Now, it's two years into a 10-year deal, but deals can be altered, as anyone who's watched Star Wars knows. Uh, is Marissa Meyer sent by Google to end the Microsoft partnership with Yahoo? Is this is she a sleeper agent? I, I don't think she's a... It's, it's, I don't think there's conspiracy yet. That'd be a really interesting story. After all, everything that happened to Yahoo already, that'd be even more killer. But I'm pretty sure that she just wants to shove Microsoft like awake. Hey, listen, guys, you guys are doing this as our partners. We can do better. Although, I don't know if the, the blame would be even on Microsoft. They're providing the search results. And the thing that Yahoo does is they package these results. The way you see the results is what Yahoo does. So if they're losing viewers or they're losing impressions, that means Yahoo's not doing their job and Bing's doing a better job. So I don't really know if it's, I'm not really sure what the statement is. Maybe it's even a wake up call to Yahoo saying, hey guys, we're losing market share to our partner. We have the same data. Why can't we present it better than they can? Now what you're saying makes sense, but uh -huh. let me add an unrelated fact to the conspiracy Let's theory. Um, Yahoo's signing a deal with to, to use Google as an ad partner. It's conspiracy. Sleeper agent. Right, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah. See? Yeah. Totally. Well, didn't That's... Google want to buy Yahoo a while ago and then didn't happen? I well, Microsoft. I, 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 my comes from Google, so I know that you, you Google always sort of has to be the conversation because of her experience and, and, and her connections, but... This sounds to me more like Meyer saying, we have a partnership that doesn't work well for Yahoo. Let's change it. Yeah. You know, we got eight years left and we don't have eight years. I, think I mean, I'll, we don't I'll, have eight years to, to, to keep screwing up. I'm being a little silly on purpose because a lot of people see this as, as Yahoo bashing Microsoft or something. But I think what Marissa Meyer is saying is what I is saying and what you're saying too, which is l let's... Let's make this work. Let's figure out how to improve things. And I think that's why people have confidence in her. She, she, does, she is coming in with some sense. So. Well, back into this crazy world. Okay. okay it's like, could it be possible that Yahoo wants to go back into search and do that by themselves instead of partnering up with Microsoft? Ooh, see, that's the opposite conspiracy theory, right? Marissa Meyer upset at how she was treated at Google now wants to build her own Google at Yahoo. But, mm -hmm. but, but isn't that the whole point of her being CEO of Yahoo? Isn't that like... 
obvious? Why wouldn't she want to do that? Well, the cost and expense of building a search engine within Yahoo, once they've dismantled it and mm -hmm. outsourced it to Microsoft, and before that it was outsourced to Google, makes it difficult. Doesn't mean she wouldn't do it, but that that's a tall order. And she's got a lot of other things to clean up before she would start that, I would think. Right. Well, we've all talked craziness and talked sense. So now let's talk AOL. <laughs> all right. So uh, I mentioned in the news views that AOL uh, has 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 acquired the gadget site, Gadget, GDGT. And uh, this was confirmed in a blog post by Ryan Block um, on the Gadget blog. Although this was, a, uh, this was a rumor almost two weeks ago, a little less than that, TechCrunch had, had reported that a deal was in the works. And it's kind of funny because AOL is, owns TechCrunch. So anyway, uh, so we just have to assume that they didn't know anything that, that uh, they couldn't talk about. Said that uh, they have sources, um, wherever those sources are coming from, said that the deal uh, was in the high seven figures, although no official numbers have been announced at this time, and that Gadget had turned down another offer because AOL was a better fit. Now, that's possibly true because the co-founders of Gadget, Peter Rojas and Ryan Block, who are friends of TNT and both appear here uh, from time to time. Yeah, we got Pete coming on the show next week, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, our, uh, and, and Gadget alums, uh, which is an AOL property as well. AOL's got a lot of properties. And the, the idea here, uh, the reason that I'm interested in this is I've always, I've always liked Gadget a lot. And if you're not familiar with it, it's not only a product database, but sort of a uh, uh, um, helping to... Um, uh, to give the consumer the tools to make uh, good buying decisions when it comes to electronics. And there's a big community and, and, and message boards. And Data and community driven rather than editorially driven. Exactly. Although there was some editorial that, bit, yeah. that crept into to Gadget, especially more recently because, of course, the, the, the Engadget spin. But uh, Gadget has already been working with Engadget um, and some other publishers with uh, its data box for, gosh, more than a year, since 2011, at least in Engadget's case, that pulls data from Gadget's product database into a, a module. You may have seen them at the bottom of Engadget posts, for example. And AOL had been one of Gadget's uh, investors prior to the announcement. I have to say, it, you know, there's, I think there is the tendency for people to go, oh, well, all right, another company sold out. They were independent and now they belong to AOL and it's just, you know, another sort of, corporate entity. But it makes a lot of sense because Gadget is a very powerful brand. And to have that kind of e-commerce component and huge product database that AOL can now put across all of their properties makes so much sense for AOL. I think this is such a smart buy for them. Yeah. And the other thing is, I mean, we, we had this big controversy over CBS messing with uh, CNET when it comes to integrity of editorials and things. When you're talking about product reviews, you got uh, Gadget. Gadget's got all, like, all these reviews from all the users, so you actually get a much larger amount of reviews out there as opposed to going, did something happen up, up top? These reviews are done by users for the most part, and that changes the way this is perceived. So then in Gadget or any of the other properties that are linking to GDGT, they'll be able to say, okay, that's, that's completely or theoretically unbiased. This is a much larger sample pool as opposed to going, what happened in the backstory? You don't even want to think about that. You want to make sure that the reviews you're getting are top notch. Yeah, I, I hope they can share vowels too. Because <laughs> that's, that's one thing I've been waiting for, uh, for Gadget for a long time. I should, I should say that I was an advisor for Gadget. Uh, so I, I, I'm not going to comment on the deal itself or anything like that. But what I think is interesting about this is AOL is definitely creating a stable of high quality content. And it's mostly around tech. Uh, mm -hmm. And Gadget, TechCrunch, now now Gadget as part of that. Ryan Block's new job is going to be helping the tech journalism properties with their product. So not with their editorial, but to beef up the uh, the uh, the way that they display data and, and innovate more and, and how they do that sort of thing. And, you know, not just the, the Gadget product details and all of that, but just all kinds of ways. So I'm interested to see what they end up doing uh, as they go forward. Live events as well. Yeah, um, and, and Gadget and, is embarking on a series of live events that 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 they will be rolling out uh, this year. Gadget has had a lot of success with their live events. It just it just makes more sense to have a little bit of the the the, the hardware and software that Engadget is writing about, and not just Engadget. Joystick is is, is another AOL property. All um, right, and unofficial Apple web blog too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about those. Yeah. So it's 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 going to be interesting to watch AOL now as they. Uh, as they move forward. But I, I feel like 
they're much different than they were back in the day. Let's finish up with uh, Netflix. Uh, we got some numbers for House of Cards. No, we have no numbers. Of course not. We have uh, we have Netflix Chief Content Officer Ted Sarandos talking at the dive into media conference, saying House of Cards is the most watched piece. When he was asked, what does that mean? What does what most watch mean? He says it's both the number of hours watched and the number of people without giving any numbers what those numbers would be. So Sarandos wouldn't give numbers. We're not doing ratings, he said. He has no motivation to talk numbers because there are no advertisers. What's the point of that? That's what he was saying. Did say people watch episode one, watch episode two. And he said that they're changing the water cooler discussions because basically other shows that are weekly have that thing where you show up and you all, did you watch last week's episode of Walking Dead or whatever it would be? They don't have that. So they are apparently are changing that, that model. Now, traditionally, having the most watched program would attract advertisers, right? You'd be like, yeah, I have the best show. And then you get, show, you get more advertising on networks. What does it mean to be the most watched thing on Netflix, Tom? How do they leverage this? Well, we talk about this a lot on the on frame rate. Uh, in fact, we had Dana Brunetti on this week and talked to him about that very thing. Like, what is success for you as a producer of a show when your outlet doesn't care about ratings? I guess it's not that different from HBO and Showtime. But they said that the biggest thing is that they're free to tell the story. Uh, so they don't have to worry about overnight ratings. Uh, they don't have to worry about, oh, are we going to get halfway through the season and get canceled? They know. They, he said the biggest difference was when they made the deal with Netflix, Netflix immediately gave them two seasons. He's like, that just never happens. You never have that kind of comfort when you're when you're making a show. And it allows you to do a whole bunch of things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So what it means for Netflix, I think, is they're saying, we want to have high-quality stuff on here. So, sure, you can sign up for the 30-day free trial, watch all of House of Cards, and cancel. That's fine. That's why we do 30-day free trials. Is because we feel they'll find other things and other values to Netflix and they won't cancel. So if they come in with the intention of just watching House of Cards for free and cancel, we don't care. We want to get them in the tent and then we feel like our service will keep them around. So for other web video, we see views, we see impressions, we see all kinds of things. Does Netflix have to give a metric to say something is successful? Or can they just say, it's doing really well, people are watching it. The other thing is it's not coming out weekly or anything. So it's just this big batch. People, it is doing well, though, because everyone I know is talking about House of Cards. It, it, I, I think Netflix is... They you can do whatever they want. Uh, this is this is great for them. I think that the water cooler discussion is very interesting because I see the conversation. Not only people saying House of Cards is amazing. I'm already on episode seven. I love it. I can't stop. I you know it's so fun to binge on you know eleven episodes at once type thing. But then people are also talking about the fact that well that's weird. I just got through the whole series and I didn't have to wait. And now what? Now what? <laughs> yeah. But this is just the beginning of what is going to be a really successful model for Netflix. This is a, this is a successful show that kind of came out of nowhere. Bit of a wild card model. Let's see if it works, right? What are you laughing at? House of wild, wild cards. cards. Oh. See? Yeah. I didn't even do that on purpose. <laughs> okay. It just happened. We <laughs> both thought the same thing at the same moment. That's right. <laughs> but 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 this is yeah, it's it's like if you sign up for Netflix, you do your 30-day trial or whatever, you watch a show like this, you're like this is awesome. I can't wait for the next series or I can't wait for season 2. I mean, that's that's that that, that that's perfect. Uh, you can have my money. Sarandos was it was part of a panel at this discussion. And there was also this discussion of arrested development. Somebody asked, I think it was actually Danny Sullivan asked, "Can we be able to get these things on DVDs offline? How can we get this on arrested development's case because Fox owns it? There will be uh, it'll be available on iTunes and DVDs later." But no word on House of Cards. I think that's an intriguing model. What will Netflix do with this the show? Will they tr try to syndicate it, I guess, in some other way that you could down, or you could, I guess, offload it or download it to an offline experience? Well, and Netflix doesn't own the show. Netflix commissioned the show. The show's owned by Trigger Street, uh, Kevin Spacey and, and Dana Brunetti's uh, company. So they are licensing it outside of Netflix's territories. Netflix only has it for the United States and I think the UK and Latin America, or maybe and Canada. Uh, but for instance, in Spain, it's going to be shown on Canal Plus on, to, on regular television. So that's possible that. You know, they they could they could they could decide to just put it out on DVD at any point. Yeah, Sarandos kept talking about the license period. That's what they wanted to make sure that Netflix did really well with. If people are watching during the license period, that's what they're happy about, not actual numbers. They want engagement during that time. Yeah, and and Netflix now has it right. Even though it, it, lots of people are watching it now, people who don't get around to it, they'll still be able to go watch it all. It's not something where Netflix has to. Oh, we're we're gonna lose that to Amazon later. You know exactly. Yeah, as long as as long as the word keeps spreading, people will sign up for Netflix because they want to watch this great show. All right, let's finish up with a randomizer. Randomize, randomize me. 
Uh, we've, we've covered briefly the uh, the pricing investigations, the inquiries in Australia uh, into companies like Apple uh, and Adobe over the price of their software there. I didn't actually realize just how crazy the pricing is in Australia until I saw this article on neowind.net. In Australia, Adobe's Creative Suite 6 Master Collection cost 4344 Australian dollars. Uh, that is enough money to cover the cost of flying to Los Angeles possibly taking a cab to a, a store, buying a boxed copy of Adobe's Creative 6 Master Collection, coming back to Australia, voluntarily claiming it, paying customs duties and tax, uh, and then installing it on your machine at home. <laughs> and you'd still wow. save... Uh, 228. 228 Australian, Australian All you got to do is... <laughs> yeah. You'd save 228 over buying the yeah. digital copy. Wow. It's 684 Australian dollars cheaper than buying the boxed copy. This sounds like a task rabbit thing waiting to happen. I mean, you could be making money left and right. <laughs> All you got to do is hundred dollars savings. I'll show up with these things. We'll declare it. It'll be great. Yeah, I mean, how 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 do you make sense of this? It's the convenience of not having to fly to the U.S. Right. I guess you <laughs> have to figure in the for? cost of your time. Now you got to go to Los Angeles. I mean, who wants to? be Yeah, there? nobody wants to be there. There's nothing there. That's believe me, except burgers. Endless, endless fields of burgers. See, burgers. Delicious. It's the closest place you can go when you're down in Sydney. Yeah, it's a, you know? it's a, well, I guess there's some direct flights to San Francisco, but maybe they're not as cheap. Maybe the LA flights. The well, they're also one. a little bit longer. Yeah, cause exactly. Of, cause so, the, because of the curvature of the earth. But Neowind.net did a great job of the math here, and it really is just kind of impressive. Uh, a return flight to LA costs thousand one hundred forty-seven dollars and fifty-eight cents <laughs> on Virgin Australia, uh, and paying that still saves you. <laughs> Still saves you money because uh, what's the U.S. price is two thousand five hundred ninety nine dollars. Well, on that flight though, I had to pay two hundred twenty eight dollars to not have that flight. It yeah. seems like it'd be a bit of a pain. Well, you That's could just tour the U.S. while you're here. I mean, you do have to take the flight. All right, uh, yeah, and you'd have to pay for a passport if you don't already have a passport. So there's some, yeah. there's some infrastructure mm. costs to consider. <laughs> Let's see what's incoming. A hey, calendar. Um, we don't have calendar today. No. Nothing's happening Fine. tomorrow, Jason. But Jeez. Thank you for calling it. Fine. Right here. You happy? <laughs> uh, John uh, called in with a, a pretty good use t case, I think, for paying for things with hashtags on Twitter. Hey, GT crew. John from Austin. Hey, one use case I could think of for that tweeting hashtags to pay with an Amex card would be at the ballpark. Uh, specifically the baseball park. Imagine the uh, the vendors coming up to you and having on the front of their uh, little box a hashtag, a uh, hashtag for a beer or a hashtag for a popcorn or whatever it is that they happen to be selling. It gives you another option to pay for things in a, in a setting where you may not have cash available and may not be able to get to an ATM machine quickly. So I'm sure there's other possible use cases. And I think that some ballparks have some options similar to this to pay, but this makes it easier. Thanks. Yeah. I love this idea. I think that suddenly I like paying for things with hashtags. Because like, you can see the vendor far away, and you're like, you can tell them what seat you're at, yeah. and they can just bring it to you. Oh, but then everybody on Twitter knows what seat you're at. So? It's a privacy violation. Because <laughs> they can't see you sitting in row 19. Unless they buy you beer. <laughs> then you're your best friend. Then, yeah, then it's awesome. Uh, also got a, another payment-related call. This one, uh, a call from Colorado with an idea for the American Express Twitter deal. Hey, TNT. Thanks, as always, for a great show. I'm listening to the discussion about Twitter and Amex. And having worked in nonprofits for a long time, I have the perfect use case for this, which is a donation drive. How cool would it be to tweet that you were donating money to something and then see your friends start to donate too and then have it spiral out from there? Unfortunately, I don't think that's what Twitter and Amex have in mind because that's not the best way for them to make money. But it is one of the best use cases that I can think of for using social media to pay for something. Thanks. Now we've got two great ideas. I even like this idea better. Yeah. Uh, the sport, the sports one appeals to the sports fan in me, but this actually is widely applicable. And I think people would be less, I don't know, Sarah, what do you think? Would people be less annoyed if you're hashtagging your charity donations? Of course. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just charity. the nature of, yeah, nonprofit right. versus for-profit. I guess it could get kind of annoying if it's constant. Well, I think anything that is perceived as self-promotion 
that 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 there's just too much of it mm -hmm. is is always gets annoying. You, that's 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 just sort of like the delicate dance you have to do on 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 sites like Twitter. So so yes, I I see I see the point. I, I, I like both these ideas. Thanks for uh, calling. We're getting great calls these days. Keep it up. Jason just put in the doc that maybe. Adobe cuts prices in Australia following price gouging probe. So I, I haven't read the full article, but the price. Of See, all we had to do was talk about it and laugh about Boom. it a little bit. Solution. Thank you. Actually, it's, I wouldn't Once be again, surprised. Once again, TNT if... changes the world. I've, yes, it was all <laughs> us. Never mind. It had nothing to do with the inquiry. <laughs> Uh, we got one more email before we get out of here. Yeah, Sarah. Greg wrote us and said, I thought I'd pass along an important piece of information that might help shed some light on why Nike has no plans to bring a fuel band app to Android. Apparently, Tim Cook is on Nike's board. So I would say your theory of there being some kind of exclusivity agreement between Nike and Apple is a pretty safe bet. And he linked to a Mac Rumors article that mentions that. Yeah, you know, I... I, I knew that. I had sort of forgotten about it when we were talking about... I didn't know that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but one guy on a board doesn't make an exclusive deal. I mean, Steve Jobs was with Disney, and he was on the board. He got some deals through because he was a private shareholder. I don't think one guy is going to be able to go, yeah, you know what, your whole company, you work with us now. Well, no, no, no. I don't think Greg is saying Tim Cook is on Nike's board, therefore Apple or, uh, is on Nike's board, therefore Nike won't ever work with Android. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense that the relationship between Nike and Apple is probably pretty good. Agreed. And he has he has some say. Looked uh, at that CNET article, uh, Jason, and 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 I noticed that they've lowered the price of the subscription model, but they don't say anything about the box copy. So it still might get be on worth, that airplane. <laughs> still might be worth the flight. <laughs> we'll say. see you soon. Go to Dinah's Chicken near LAX. All you can eat chicken on Mondays and Wednesdays. It's great. Uh, that is it for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, join our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, and make your voice heard on what stories we cover each day. We always look at this to decide uh, what stories we're going to cover, and uh, we see we'll, how people are voting, what stories they're voting up, what stories they're voting down, helps us to decide what we cover each and every day. You can also uh, find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. We've been getting some great voicemails. 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Clayton Morris. We'll see you then.